The crocodile had clamped its jaws around his arm and had taken all the skin and soft tissue. Very large gash on the left thigh from the groin down to the outer thigh. Two for two, have you responding code one? We have a young lady unconscious. Topic approach 1320. Hi, I'm Landon Mitchell from the Royal Flying Doctor Service, and this is a podcast series about mateship, about life in the bush, and about the role that the Royal Flying Doctor Service plays in servicing rural communities. This is the Flying Doctor Podcast. He had a degloving of his arm. His hand was like an anatomy lesson, like there was vessels and bones and all sorts of things. It was like something out of sort of a haunted house. We're travelling to another part of Australia in today's interview, another very remote and beautiful part of Australia, Cape York Peninsula. Katrina Starmer, a medical officer of the RFDS, is going to be our guest and she's going to tell the story of an off-duty wildlife ranger named Craig Dickman. 54 years old, he'd been fly fishing at Captain Billy Landing when a 2.5 metre crocodile launched from the water and attacked his thigh. While trying to wrestle free from the crocodile, Craig was able to release himself by gouging the crocodile in the eye. He then drove himself for more than an hour to Heathland Station, where he called emergency services while being given first aid by another ranger. Katrina, the medical officer for RFTS Cairns, received the emergency call. So that's where our story begins. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Lana. Before we dive further into the story of Craig, let me first ask you about the work you do for the RFDS. I started off doing retrievals and flying about the countryside to pick up people who are critically unwell. And now I've branched into um, doing clinics as well. So going out to small towns and running small GP clinics, which is also challenging. Fabulous. Are you a medical doctor? Yes, I did medicine and then I did a specialty in emergency medicine and um, now I'm learning about rural and remote medicine as part of my um, work with the RFDS, which is um, very exciting. Is is that very different from other work you've done in metro areas? Yeah, there is differences between um, metro uh, medicine and rural and remote medicine and I tell you it's very enjoyable, very challenging um, to work in a rural and remote area. And one thing that I, I really take, I've taken away from from my work is uh, how resilient people in, in the bush are. Well, I think that really applies to this story. So what happened when you received the call from Craig or you learnt of the fact that a man had been mauled by a crocodile? Yeah, so I was actually on the night shift and the day shift um, doctor first found out about the crocodile attack uh, that had happened before my shift had started and they found out that he had made his way somehow to the Heathlands Ranger Station and from there um, phoned RFDS and um, was in quite a bad way. We were, we were informed that he was in shock um, and that he had a degloving of his, of his arm and uh, that he had lost a fair bit of blood. You know, this sort of gets the alarm bells ringing, and as soon as I came on to shift, I was notified about this. We call it a P1 or a priority one, which means we need to be off the ground quite promptly. So we got everything ready, and I made a few phone calls uh, to get a bit more information, and that's when we learnt um, about what had happened to Craig. What what does degloving mean? <laughs> so it had uh, the crocodile had clamped its jaws around his arm and had basically taken all the skin and soft tissue um, off his off his arm, like a, like peeling a glove back off uh, um, that someone was wearing. So it was quite quite horrific for the patient, um, and um, he was he was he was quite distressed by what by his not only his experience but also his injuries. So Craig fishing out there at Captain Billy Landing, attacked by a crocodile, and with his injuries that severe, then drove himself one hour back to Eastland Station. What sort of state was he in when you finally got through to him? Mentioning the the resilience of people in the bush, like it is just remarkable what people um, can do and how people manage when they've um, suffered sort of critical injuries. Um, it, I guess the survival mode kicks in um, and the adrenaline. And look, he, he was he was quite uh, resilient to be able to to do this. We actually, when I rang, we actually said, you know, should we get um, get your medical chest out? Because each each um, large 
centre, like a cattle station or a ranger station, has a big metal box um, with RFDS medi- medications in it. We call it RFDS medical chest. And we said to Craig and his fellow ranger, we'll get out the morphine and the needle and we'll, we'll talk you through how to inject some morphine into your to your thigh or your arm so to give you more pain relief. And Craig actually um, said, no, I cannot stand the thought of any more needles. I just want a paracetamol, just want a Panadol. <laughs> so we were quite blown away with his strength from the start. Um, so we gave him his two Panadol and uh, then we set off on, on, on the plane to go and get him. So what time of day was it by then? So it was just going on dusk and I phoned up the um, the Bramwell Station, which was the na- nearest um, light night landing strip because we have to take this into account with RFDS um, when we do night flights. It does the landing strip. Well, is it functional? So has it been washed out in a recent flood? Um, and uh, has it been, um, does it have lighting? Does it, does it have night lighting? In the olden days, I think they used to do things like park cars on either end of the of the runway and turn on their high beams for the plane to land in the in the light of the of the vehicles, um, but that that's not done um, any, anymore. There's there's a lot more standardisation and safety standards now. Um, so the the owners of Bramwell Station said yes, they do have solar lighting, so they obviously charge in the in the day and then they are lit at night. Um, but they said they sort of some of them work. So the the comment was they mostly work. Um, and so the pilot was unsure as to what we were actually um, going to find when we when we flew over. Uh, and you know it's quite remarkable. I sat up the front with the pilot that night because um, I was very interested to see what the what the landing strip looked like in in the middle of the night and it's just so beautiful to to be flying in the, in the pitch black um, and to come across this row of um, of orange lights glowing in the middle of nowhere where there's literally not another another light or, or feature you can't make out any features on the ground um, and so so we landed and as you come close to the ground um, the, the ground becomes evident comes visible and you can see all the the runway just completely dotted in um in cattle dung just everywhere and you you wonder to yourself oh like there's no ant beds hopefully um but you just uh, see you just imagine the cattle dung just going everywhere when the when the plane plane lands on the runway so it's quite it's quite a remarkable experience to to land on a dirt runway um that is lit by solar lighting in the middle of the night how far away from Cairns are you? Like how long did it take to get to Bramwell Station? Because we're talking about a really remote part of this continent. Yeah, so it took us, it takes about an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half. I think it's a, it's about 800 kilometres away um, from Cairns. And that's something, so when we fly um, to these places that are so, so remote, often we'll do other trips like we might pick up somebody who's needing to be picked up a little closer or but when it's a p1 or a priority one we just go straight there um and so we it did take us it did take us about an hour and a half and luckily because the uh the the station owner wendy said um i've got cattle on the on the strip in that paddock so like i'm gonna have to go and muster you're gonna have to give me time for me to go out and muster the cattle off this strip uh so that was lucky that was fortuitous that that she had that you know an hour and a half to get to get the cattle off so and we didn't have a, a, a cattle verse plane incident. And and how far was Craig Dickman? So he was he wasn't at Bromwell Station. He was at Heathlands. So Heathlands. He'd driven an hour from Captain Billy Landing to get to Heathland Station. How far was Heathland Station from Bramwell Station? So that was another hour and a half. Um, and that was something that uh, he had done with his colleague, his ranger colleague. So his ranger colleague drove him. Um, and when he arrived, so when 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 we when we landed um, with the plane, it was actually pretty much the same moment as um, Craig had arrived. And at this, and at the exact same moment, actually, a, the ambulance. Um, arrived from Bamaga. So there was this intersection of patient, ambulance and plane. We all arrived at Bramwell Station, just descended on Wendy and her her um, her team there at Bramwell. 
And um, it was quite remarkable because when you ring triple zero, you sort of expect, you know, the, I'll call an ambulance and the ambulance sort of rocks up if you're in town. But uh, on on uh, at Bramwell Station, when you're coming from Heathlands, which is more than an hour away, um, and you call an ambulance, it's got to come from Bamaga, which I think is like two and a half hours drive on the dirt road um, from very, the very tip of Cape York. So it's, it's, it was quite remarkable that this ambulance had taken the same amount of time to get to um, him as the plane from Cairns. So what sort of state was Craig in when you first saw him? The injury happened some hours earlier. He's now been um, driven himself for an hour and now been in a, a car for another hour and a half on two Panadol. <laughs> so what was this, what was your first impression of Craig when he um, got out of the car? So he hopped out of the car and um, we didn't know what we were going to expect. Um, but he he was all sort of bandaged up and there was blood soaking the, his bandages and there was blood soaking his shorts and his shirt. And we um, we saw that one of the one of the things that you take note of when you first see a patient is can they walk? You know what? Can they stand up? Are they talking to you? Are they are they interested in things? Are they smiling or are they just completely focused on on their pain or their injury? Um, and Craig was um, initially he was a he, it was a bit of a deer in the headlights moment because you know we we're rocking up in the middle of the night in the middle of the nowhere with this plane and this ambulance all sort of descending on him. Uh, but when we when we got him out of the car, you know, I think he made a little joke and then he said, you know, thanks so much, guys. And and you know when someone's so so able to thank someone else and, and step out of their pain or their their distress or their experience to actually thank someone like that, that was just incredible. We were blown away by his um, his re- resilience there. But we actually said to him when we saw that he was he wasn't. Um, critically unwell, we said, oh, Craig, do you mind, can we have a photo with you at the back of the plane <laughs> before we get in the plane? Because, uh, you know, as a health professional, you know, you you think, oh, you're a professional and you, you've you seen it all before. Yes, there's been a lot of uh, terrible things that I've seen in my job. Um, but, you know, we, we we still are amazed at the the strength of of our patients, and and it's just so remarkable to see what some patients go through, and and you know we still sort of they're still celebs to me, uh, <laughs> so it was a real moment there. We had a, a and it's a beautiful photo actually of Craig and the pilot, um, and the nurse Katie, who's just an amazing retrieval nurse, and myself at the back of the plane. So that was that was a, a really special moment. So Craig is celebrity of the moment, and. And he's got these injuries. Did was he looked at before he was put on the plane? Did the like or what happened? Did he get straight into the the plane or how, how does what's the process from there? So when you're in um, when you do a primary retrieval or um, a retrieval from not a hospital or not a clinic, um, sort of the middle of nowhere, you it's it the safest and most standardised and cleanest place is on the plane. So we got him into the plane where there was lighting. Um, you know, there's bandages, um, he's got a bed to lie on. So the, the first priority is to get him comfortable um, and give him pain relief. So lying him down on the bed just allowed him to, um, I think it, it just it just relieved him. Like he was a completely different person once he'd hopped on the plane and we could see and he could lie down and uh, we could assess his injuries because he, really, he hadn't really had the chance to, to do that up until that moment. So you're assessing the injuries. What was determined at that point? We unravelled the the blood-soaked bandages and we saw he had a very large gash on the left thigh, just from the groin sort of down to the outer thigh towards the knee. Um, And that was really quite deep and we were sort of... Um, not shocked but um, really pleased, really grateful that that hadn't um, gone into his femoral artery, which is the, the big vessel on in, that sort of goes from the, the abdomen or the trunk down into the leg through the groin. So that, that was very lucky and we sort of uh, thought, oh, we'll have to make sure that we keep pressure on that one because that one was oozing quite a bit of blood. So that that's... Um, we weren't at that stage concerned about him losing his leg, but if if he did have damage to his artery or vein there, then there's always that potential. So we um, just were, were very careful with that injury. And then he had the hand injury 
um, and that was on his right side. And he his hand really it was all it was like an anatomy lesson. Like there was there was vessels and tendons and bones and all sorts of things. It was like like something out of sort of a like a haunted house. He was just so strong um, to 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 let us to let us try and wash that out. We had to try and irrigate it with some some saline or some salty water to try and get it, get rid of the bugs. And that's sort of a time a time pressure or a priority to do that to try and uh, prevent infection. And how was he faring personally? Yeah, he's he was still trying to come down from the the adrenaline and the shock of the situation. People talk about you know, they're suffering from shock um, in the media a lot. Uh, the shock uh, that people think of is distress. Like that's sort of the shock that, that they talk about in, in society. But for in, in medicine, um, when you talk about shock, it's actually severe compromise or critical illness. Now, Craig wasn't actually suffering from severe compromise or critical illness. He hadn't lost um, so much blood that he was unconscious, for example, but he was suffering from significant emotional shock from the from the event, which is completely understandable. Um, but despite that, you know, he still had little, uh, his sense of humour, he still had little quips, he was still grateful and kept saying thank you. Um, so we were just really blown away by his, his manner. Uh, and it was, it was just such a privilege to meet him that night. That's amazing. Were you very quickly up in the air and, and whipped him back to Cairns or what was that next step? Yeah, well, we spent uh, probably about 20 minutes trying to clean out the wounds, give them a bit of an irrigation and um, and, and re-bandage them so they'd stop bleeding because they were, as I said, they were, they were oozing quite a, quite a bit. Um, and we gave him some antibiotics, but all the while the pilots preparing the plane and getting the logistics to, to take off. So we we were pretty much up in the air within 20 minutes. When we took off, we actually got a phone call from, I think it was Aracoon, to say a lady had been bitten by a snake and um, could we please come by and pick her up. So when, when this sort of happens with, with retrieval, you have to weigh up what's the state of the patient that I have with me? Are they critically unwell? Do they need to go straight to where we're going? Or can we do a detour? What's the state of the patient you know, that we get the phone, this other phone call about, do we need to do detour to them? Some, in some cases, you actually drop off the patient you've got and pick up the other patient. So it's, it's actually very, uh, it's, it's a real juggle. And that's, I think that's part of the, the job is not just being able to manage a patient medically, but also being able to manage the logistics. So Craig's condition, it wasn't necessarily medically complex. There was bleeding, there was injury, there was lots of soft tissue damage, there was probably limb-threatening injuries. Um, but he wasn't, he didn't have life-threatening injuries at that point in time. So we were able to go and do this detour to Aracoon to pick up this lady who'd had the snake bite. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to, we, we didn't have enough fuel. So we actually had to go via Cohen to refuel um, and then to Aracoon. And it was funny, we, we rocked up to Cohen and you sort of turn up to these places in the middle of the night and like there's there's no one at the airport, there's no full-time airport staff. Um, you have to call the, the refueler out and they sort of come out, you know, woke him up out of bed and I, I joked and said, this fella looks like he's in his pyjamas. And I tell you what, they, um, you know, they just do such a great, it's, it's, an, it's a job um, that just does such a great community service um, for these fellas to wake up and come out and refuel the plane so we can go from somewhere else to somewhere else. Like we're not even helping their particular community. And it's just, it just highlighted to me how, what a contribution each member of this giant team across Cape York made to help Craig get to where he needed to be. Wow. Okay. So you've now got fuel and you're heading off to pick up a snake bite victim. So could you tell me briefly about who that was and what that circumstance was? She was an Indigenous lady uh, who had, had been bitten by a snake, although it, it, it's, it was difficult to know whether it was a snake or a stick. Actually, a lot of, um, a lot of snake bites that we get phone calls about turn out to be sticks. A lot of people, if they haven't visualised a snake, we still treat them as if they were bitten by a snake. So in many cases, we, we retrieve patients whether they saw the snake or not. So she was well 
Um, but as, as mentioned, you know, we have to bring her to Cairns so she can have the blood test and be treated as though it was a snake. You know, she was very patient. Craig was very patient. They, they just were so understanding that we had to go to all these different places and, and just do what we, what we have to do to help people and help the clinics and help the remote communities all across Cape York. So Craig, one of the funny things was, uh, Craig had no, he had no, um, hands to, scratch his nose or anything. So when we descended into Arakoon to pick up this, the lady, you know, he, he said, oh, I can't equalize. Um, can you press on my nose? So I had to, <laughs> I had to provide a, a additional service of uh, nose pressing so he could, he could equalize um, both in descent and coming back up at Arakoon as well. But you know, this is all part of the service. <laughs> all part of the in-flight entertainment. That's right. Yes. So, okay, so there you are now flying from Arakoon. How long does it take you to get back to Cairns? So the flight from Arakoon is about an hour and a bit. And I'm not sure if Craig had a little snooze. I think um, the the other patient got to have a little snooze. But, um, you know, this is, it's really, it's really mindful. You've got to be mindful of, of people flying in the night. A lot of our Indigenous patients especially may not have been on a plane, certainly not on a small plane and at not at night. So this is a real consideration and, and I always have to um, remind myself and be mindful that this this can actually not only have these people experience something upsetting like a snake bite or a crocodile attack, but then they also have to hop in this tiny tin tube and fly across the countryside in the pitch black, um, you know, away from country, away from their family. Uh, so there's lots of things at stake here for people and, uh, you know, we're sort of all in it together coming back um, down from Arakoon to Cairns, uh, but it all it will, all went perfectly well. So you land in Cairns and I presume there's an ambulance waiting? Yeah, so the ambulance sort of rocks up to the airport and we um, touch down and hand over and, of course, I had this quintessentially Australian sort of handover with a snake bite and a crocodile attack and... Um, you know, you try not to sort of make a deal of it or, 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 or make light of it when, you know, you're with patients. You want to, them to feel that you're, you're certainly, um, you're taking their distress and things seriously. But by that time, everyone had pain relief on board. Everyone was happy. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, the ambulance, um, the members of the Queensland Ambulance Service that came to pick the patients up were like amazed. You know, here we are with these these two and... Um, uh, look, I just wanted to to thank uh, not only the patients, but you know all the uh, the staff and the people across Cape York that all came together to 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 make this happen. You know, from from Craig and his his ranger friend to to Wendy at Bramwell Station to the the paramedic that came down from Barramaga after a two and a half hour drive. You know, to to meet um, to to intersect on um, Bramwell and then to go via Cohen and, and, and for the, you know, the refueler that comes out in the middle of the night and then the, the team at Aracoon, the clinic there, clinic nurses to bring out that, their patient. And, and it all, the QAS officers, when, when we get into Cairns, you know, it's quite remarkable. You, you know, you do all this in the middle of the night and you fly over people's houses and sort of they're tucked comfortably into their beds. And, and it, it's just such a remarkable thing that patients and the team sort of experience together. Uh, so it's a really, it's a real privilege to be part of that. That's wonderful. Once um, Craig has been whisked off to hospital for surgery, did you get any local updates after that over the next couple of days? Was there any news about how he was progressing? Yeah, I went to visit him. I tend to get attached to my patients. <laughs> and I, always, I always follow up and make sure they're okay and see how they go. Uh, and he had his operation and it's a real credit to the surgeons. You know, they were able to graft and um, reattach things on his hand uh, to, to make it uh, basically appear as as new, like it was remarkable. And I, um, I actually... He, he went back to work like months later. He, he was a, working as a ranger more locally around Cairns and I was up doing a, a clinic in Chilligo, which is about three hours um, northwest of Cairns. And he randomly rocked up during COVID for a COVID, um, like a, a routine sort of COVID screen that they have to do for the rangers. And uh, yeah, it was like a reunion. Like we, <laughs> we were like, oh, hello again. Like we just have to stop meeting like this. And we got a photo with his hand and it just looked so perfect. And, and I was just so pleased for him. 
Uh, so that was a really special moment. So what touched you personally about this retrieval of Craig? Mostly the the resilience of Craig, but also the, the incredible teamwork that people in the bush um, show and uh, when they come together as volunteers, half of them, to, to help someone, someone in need. Because, you know, the infrastructure isn't, isn't necessarily there like it is for people in the city. And I've seen, you know, people who've, who've transported patients in their own helicopters, you know, station um, chopper pilots uh, who've moved people who are critically unwell to a site where the plane can land. And I've seen people take people in the back of their utes or even in their boat uh, across, you know, from an island um, to meet us on the plane. It's just, it's just so wonderful to be part of this you know, thrown together team of people trying to help someone in need. And, you know, that's just such a privilege. And, and I just, I just am so grateful to be part of it. Katrina, I am, I really enjoyed talking to you. You've given some wonderful insight into your work with the RFDS and um, you're one of so many who dedicated, professional and caring, passionate staff. It's just been such a pleasure. Thank you for telling us about Craig's story today. And I'm really happy that he's well and that he has all of his limbs and his hand and that he's um, still continuing his work as a wildlife ranger in maybe a different capacity. But and I'm, and I'm also really, really happy that you and the Cairns team are there for everyone, regardless of who runs amok and who needs assistance. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Lana. The Flying Doctor podcast was presented by me, Lana Mitchell. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with someone who you think will love it too. Thank you for listening to The Flying Doctor podcast.